March 1st, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Leviticus chapters 24 and 25 from the Old Testament. The Lord spoke to Moses, Command the Israelites to bring to you pure oil of beaten olives for the light, to make a lamp burn continually. Outside the veil canopy of the congregation in the meeting tent, Aaron must arrange it from evening until morning before the Lord continually. This is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. On the ceremonial pure lampstand, he must arrange the lamps before the Lord continually. He must take choice wheat flour and bake 12 loaves. There must be two tenths of an ephah of flour in each loaf. And you must set them in two rows, six in a row, on the ceremonial pure table before the Lord. You must put pure frankincense on each row, and it will become a memorial portion for the bread, a gift to the Lord. Each Sabbath day, Aaron must arrange it before the Lord continually. This portion is from the Israelites as a perpetual covenant. It will belong to Aaron and his sons, and they must eat it in a holy place because it is most holy to him, a perpetual allotted portion from the gifts of the Lord. Now an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the Israelites. And the Israelite woman's son and an Israelite man had a fight in the camp. The Israelite woman's son misused the name and cursed, so they brought him to Moses. Now his mother's name was Shalomith, daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. So they placed him in custody until they were able to make a clear legal decision for themselves based on words from the mouth of the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Bring the one who cursed outside the camp, and all who heard him are to lay their hands on his head, and the whole congregation is to stone him to death. Moreover, you are to tell the Israelites, If any man curses his God, he will bear responsibility for his sin. And one who misuses the name of the Lord must surely be put to death. The whole congregation must surely stone him, whether he is a foreigner or a native citizen. When he misuses the name, he must be put to death. If a man beats any person to death, he must be put to death. One who beats an animal to death must make restitution for it, life for life. If a man inflicts an injury on his fellow citizens, just as he has done it must be done to him, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Just as he inflicts an injury on another person, that same injury must be inflicted on him. One who beats an animal to death must make restitution for it, but one who beats a person to death must be put to death. There will be one regulation for you, whether a foreigner or a native citizen, for I am the Lord your God. Then Moses spoke to the Israelites, and they brought the one who cursed outside the camp and stoned him with stones. So the Israelites did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai. Speak to the Israelites and tell them, When you enter the land that I am giving you, the land must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you may sow your field, and six years you may prune your vineyard and gather the produce. But in the seventh year, the lamb must have a Sabbath of complete rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You must not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You must not gather in the aftergrowth of your harvest, and you must not pick the grapes of your unpruned vines. The lamb must have a year of complete rest. You may have the Sabbath produce of the land to eat. You, your male servant, your female servant, your hired worker, the resident foreigner who stays with you, your cattle, and the wild animals that are in your land. All its produce will be for you to eat. You must count off seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, and the days of the seven weeks of years will amount to 49 years. You must sound loud horn blast in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, on the day of atonement. You must sound the horn in your entire land. So you must consecrate the 50th year, and you must proclaim a release in the land for all its inhabitants. That year will be your jubilee. Each one of you must return to his property, and each one of you must return to his clan. That 50th year will be your jubilee. You must not sow the land, harvest its aftergrowth, 
or pick the grapes of its unpruned vines. Because that year is a jubilee, it will be holy to you. You may eat its produce from the field. In this year of jubilee, you must each return to your property. If you make a sale to your fellow citizen or buy from your fellow citizen, no one is to wrong his brother. You may buy it from your fellow citizen according to the number of years since the last jubilee. He may sell it to you according to the years of produce that are left. The more years there are, the more you may make its purchase price, and the fewer years there are, the less you may make its purchase price, because he is only selling to you a number of years of produce. No one is to oppress his fellow citizen, but you must fear your God, because I am the Lord your God. You must obey my statutes and my regulations. You must be sure to keep them so that you may live securely in the land. The land will give its fruit, and you may eat until you are satisfied, and you may live securely in the land. If you say, What will we eat in the seventh year if we do not sow and gather our produce? I will command my blessings for you in the sixth year, so it may yield the produce for three years. And you may sow the eighth year and eat from that sixth year's produce, old produce. Until you bring in the ninth year's produce, you may eat old produce. The land must not be sold without reclaim, because the land belongs to me, for you are foreigners and residents with me. In all your landed property, you must provide for the right of redemption of the land. If your brother becomes impoverished and sells some of his property, his near redeemer is to come to you and redeem what his brother sold. If a man has no redeemer, but he prospers and gains enough for its redemption, he is to calculate the value of the years it was sold, refund the balance to the man to whom he has sold it, and return to his property. If he has not prospered enough to refund a balance to him, then what he sold will belong to the one who bought it until the jubilee year. But it must revert in the jubilee, and the original owner may return to his property. If a man sells a residential house in a walled city, its right of redemption must extend until one full year from its sale. Its right of redemption must extend to a full calendar year. If it is not redeemed before the full calendar year is ended, the house in the walled city will belong without reclaim to the one who bought it throughout his generations. It will not revert in the jubilee. The houses of villages, however, which have no wall surrounding them, must be considered as the field of the land. They will have the right of redemption and must revert in the jubilee. As for the cities of the Levites, the houses in the cities which they possess, the Levites must have a perpetual right of redemption. Whatever someone among the Levites might redeem, the sale of a house, which is his property in a city, must revert in the jubilee because the houses of the cities of the Levites are their property in the midst of the Israelites. Moreover, the open field areas of their cities must not be sold, because that is their perpetual possession. If your brother becomes impoverished and is indebted to you, you must support him. He must live with you like a foreign resident. Do not take interest or profit from him, but you must fear your God, and your brother must live with you. You must not lend him your money at interest, and you must not sell him food for profit. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan, to be your God. If your brother becomes impoverished with regard to you so that he sells himself to you, you must not subject him to slave service. He must be with you as a hired worker, as a resident foreigner. He must serve with you until the year of Jubilee. But then he may go free, he and his children with him, and he may return to his family and to the property of his ancestors. Since they are my servants whom I brought out from the land of Egypt, they must not be sold in a slave sale. You must not rule over him harshly, but you must fear your God. As for your male and female slaves who may belong to you, you may buy male and female slaves from the nations all around you. Also you may buy slaves from the children of the foreigners who reside with you, and from their families that are with you, whom they have fathered in your land. They may become your property. You may give them as inheritance to your children after you to possess as property. You may enslave them perpetually. However, as for your brothers the Israelites, 
No man may rule over his brother harshly. If a resident foreigner who is with you prospers and your brother becomes impoverished with regard to him, so that he sells himself to a resident foreigner who is with you or to a member of a foreigner's family, after he has sold himself, he retains a right of redemption. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle or his cousin may redeem him, or any one of the rest of his blood relatives. His family may redeem him, or if he prospers, he may redeem himself. He must calculate with the one who bought him the number of years from the year he sold himself to him until the jubilee year, and the cost of his sale must correspond to the number of years, according to the rate of wages a hired worker would have earned while with him. If there are still many years in keeping with them, he must refund most of the cost of his purchase for his redemption. But if only a few years remain until the jubilee, he must calculate for himself in keeping with the remaining years and refund it for his redemption. He must be with the one who bought him like a yearly hired worker. The one who bought him must not rule over him harshly in your sight. If, however, he is not redeemed in these ways, he must go free in the jubilee year, he and his children with him. Because the Israelites are my own servants, they are my servants whom I brought out from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God, I was reading Beth Moore the other day, and she made a statement that kind of goes a lot right in line with a lot of things I'm studying right now about you. How often we expect big things from God without preparing for big things from Him. And I just think of all the times we come before you in prayer and we ask for these big things, these big changes, these big desires of our hearts, these big life shifts or answers to these to these changes in our lives. But we do it almost with the irreverence of going to the drive through of a fast food restaurant. You know, it's it's really interesting. I'm doing a lot of, as you know <laughs> I'm doing a lot of studying about how you sometimes turn your back to our prayers I completely believe that you hear all of our prayers I don't have a issue with that but it's fascinating how often in the Bible we pick and choose what we want to believe about Christianity or we pick and choose what we want to believe about you God and it's usually all the good stuff most of it from the New Testament but it is not up to us to pick and choose which part of the Bible we want to believe in. It is all God breathed. It is all from you. So I think we need to keep in mind that you are sovereign and what that means. You created every single thing in this entire world. And sometimes when we come to you, and we're holding on to sin in our heart, whether that is a sin of sexuality, a sin of ego, a sin of finances, a sin of whatever the choice is. <laughs> and we're holding on to that sin in our heart, yet we come before you in, in prayer and we ask for things, sometimes small, sometimes big, like what Beth is talking about. And we actually expect you to be a kind, understanding God and, and still be okay with us acting that way. And it just floors me, the sheer arrogance that we would come to you in prayer and think that you're willing to listen to us when all we do is keep choosing sin over you. I don't know. I don't mean to sound like I'm in a soapbox. You know, I'm very passionate about different things that I study and learning more about your word. But right now, just the fact that people don't fear you. Not, not in the way that, uh, one, you deserve to be feared. But two, the people in the Old Testament got it. To take your name in vain and, and they would actually be stoned. 
to be in awe of how holy you were, how set apart you were, how, how big and gigantic and sovereign you were, that they couldn't even speak your name. That your name was actually the name because they di didn't even want to utter the word God. How beautiful is that? How respectful is that? How God honoring is that? And yet today with our casual Christianity, we have more of a buddy in Jesus. There's no awe. There's no fear. There's no understanding of who we're actually coming before with our prayers. God, I just pray today for this, this surface relationship that is happening throughout the American churches throughout so many Christians. This wishy-washiness, this apathy. And I'm not talking about just the Christians who, who show up at church on Sunday and then live uh, a different life the other six days. I'm talking about the people who are willing to be Christians seven days of the week. But who still pick and choose which part is comfortable to them. That they're trying to figure out how to make you and Jesus and the Bible fit into their life. God, how arrogant are we that we honestly think that this is how this works? God, I pray for awe. I pray that we get down on our knees today and thank you for all of the incredible things that you have given us that we so don't deserve. I pray for humbleness. That we truly understand who we are and who we aren't in this world. And more importantly, who you are. God, I pray for passion. I pray for hearts that will fall in love with you and be passionately crazy, awesome, in love with you. For hearts that would cast off things of this world, that the things of this world become so not important anymore. That what is important is you and your word and a relationship with your son. I was just thinking the other day, driving home from the beach, and how many people I encountered that week who were working in their job. Whether it was at the coffee shop, or the market, or the restaurant. I was also thinking of my friends who were working that day at church. And I realized if we all just really understood God, how big you are, <laughs> if we really understood that you are our God and why we were created, there'd be no more need for, for jobs <laughs> or school to then eventually go on to jobs. If we all really finally got it, it would just be so amazing because all we would do all day long, God, is glorify you. We would worship you. And then I remember laughing to myself, realizing that that's what heaven is. That's what heaven is going to be. I guess I just, as I catch glimpses, of just how big you are and how amazing you truly are. Uh, the more and more I just want heaven to happen on earth. The more passion I get that I just really want people to understand this amazing relationship they could have with you. This powerful relationship they could have with you.
God, we have come so far from understanding who you truly are. Such a watered down version of what you actually created. And I am so sorry. Because I have done it just as much, if not more, than anybody else. But today, God, passion, depth, reverence. I am honored and blessed and in awe that you are my God, that I get to be your child and that you love me with a love that I will never understand. And for that, I am so incredibly thankful. I love you so much. In your son's name we pray. Amen.